The Gong The exact origin of the gong is a mystery, difficult to determine with absolute certainty, as its history predates written records. It is believed that the gong appeared during the Bronze Age in Sumer, the land that is now Iran and Iraq, and that it had something to do with wheat agriculture. Sumer is the earliest known civilization in the region of southern Mesopotamia, emerging during the early Bronze Age, between the 6th and 5th millennium BC. In fact, it is thought that wheat have first been cultivated here. It would have been grounded into flour, mixed with water, then cooked in some sort of earth oven, to make bread. Here, the heating element, were layers of red-hot rocks, powered by a fire, at the bottom of the pit. It would get very hot inside. As the population grew, the ovens become larger and hotter, to the point where the rock minerals would melt to form a pool of molten rock. The first molten metals would have been tin, then copper. Together they would form a new alloy. This alloy is bronze, and it would solidify it at the bottom of this earth oven, in some sort of circular shape. This metal disc, made totally by accident, would have been the first, crude gong. We can only speculate, that this shiny new piece of roundish metal, would have aroused the curiosity of our ancient ancestors. As the Bronze Age evolved, by trial and error, they would have probably been able to perfect this process, to deliberately make an early version of the gong, to be used as some sort of musical instrument. Eventually as time passed, in Asia, the craft of gong making, became widespread. The earliest actual evidence of gong making, dates back to around 200 BC in China. A bronze gong was found in a tomb dating to the Han Dynasty. However, archaeologists have traced the origin of the gong even further back to the second millennium BC. These early gongs, were likely used for ceremonial and spiritual purposes, for altering consciousness, for banishing evil spirits, for religious rituals and feasts. The use of gongs then spread to Southeast Asia, where they became an integral part of the musical traditions and cultures of various countries, including China, Indonesia, Vietnam, Thailand, and the Philippines. Each region developed its own unique gong traditions and playing styles. Gong making was considered a sacred craft, passed down from generation to generation and was veiled in a sense of mystery. Gong makers believed that there were higher powers involved in the magic art of making a gong, and that they could only succeed with their help. In China, gongs have been employed in various religious and ceremonial practices. They are used in Taoist, Buddhist, and Confucian rituals, as well as in traditional folk customs. The resonant and powerful sound of the gong is believed to help drive away evil spirits, attract positive energies and create an auspicious atmosphere. They are essential components of Chinese traditional music, often included in traditional orchestras and opera performances. They provide rhythmic accents, add depth to the music, and create dramatic effects. Gongs are commonly used in traditional dragon and lion dances in China. Historically, they were part of imperial court orchestras and were associated with state ceremonies, grand processions and royal events. In Vietnam, gong music often involves ensembles, consisting of various sizes and types of gongs. The ensembles typically include several gongs, played simultaneously, producing complex and mesmerizing rhythmic patterns. However, the gong's role extends beyond music, serving as a symbol of cultural identity, community cohesion, and spiritual connection. In Indonesia, the gong plays a central role in the gamelan orchestra, which is a traditional ensemble consisting of various percussion instruments, including large hanging gongs. 
The gamelan ensemble is associated with court music, religious ceremonies, and traditional performances. The word gong, in fact, is believed to have originated from the Javanese language, spoken in the island of Java in Indonesia. The Javanese language has had a significant influence on the cultural and musical traditions of the region. In fact, the Javanese term for gong is benang, and it refers specifically to the instrument itself, while the term gamelan is used to describe the traditional ensemble that includes gongs, along with other instruments. As gongs spread to other parts of Asia and beyond, the term Benang was shortened to gong and adapted by various cultures and languages. It has become widely recognized and used internationally to refer to this musical instrument. It is important to note that gongs also have a presence in other cultures outside of East Asia. For example, gongs have been used in African music traditions, particularly in countries such as Nigeria and Ghana. Gongs finally arrived in Europe around the 17th century. They were used in monasteries to call monks to prayers. Smaller gongs were also used to call guests to the table, or to summon servants in rich aristocratic families, just like in the popular TV series Downton Abbey. Big symphonic gongs were also incorporated into Western classical music. In the 18th century, French composer François-Joseph Gossec was the first to introduce a symphonic gong in his music, followed by other great composers such as Wagner and Puccini. We then jump to the 60s, in USA, where Yogi Bhajan played a significant role in spreading the use of the gong in the Western world, particularly in the context of meditation, healing, and kundalini yoga practices. He was an influential spiritual teacher, leader, and entrepreneur. He is primarily known for introducing kundalini yoga to the Western world and founding the healthy, happy, holy, organization. His teachings and practices with the gong were more active than just mere relaxation, focused on pushing individuals to break through their resistance and expand their consciousness. In addition to meditation and spiritual practices, Yogi Bhajan saw the gong as a tool to aid individuals in recovering from the effects of drug use. He believed that the gong's vibrations could help restore balance to the nervous system, heal emotional wounds, and support the process of recovery and transformation. Today, the gong has begun to be appreciated again. We are beginning to remember the ancient wisdom of our ancestors in the use of these ancient sacred instruments. Thanks also to the work of gong master, Don Conroe, a student of Yogi Bhajan, who has dedicated his life to exploring the transformative and healing power of sound, leading the way in the use of gongs for meditation, therapy, and spiritual practices. Nowadays, the gong is used not only in music but also in sound healing. Sound baths, with their soothing and transformative qualities, have gained recognition as a form of sound therapy to promote relaxation and reduce stress. The vibrations produced by the gong help tune the body and restore harmony, synchronizing our brain waves. The brain finds it difficult to follow the sounds of the gong as they cannot be compared to any musical instrument. So it surrenders and enters a deep state of relaxation, producing delta and theta brain waves, the slowest and deepest waves reached during deep sleep or deep meditation. The sound waves generated by the gong travel through the air, cocooning the listeners with their immersive and ethereal qualities. It is a sensory experience that commands attention, reverberating with a unique blend of depth, complexity, and spiritual allure. The gong is undoubtedly the ultimate tool for sound healing, as it includes all tones of the sound spectrum. And the space created by the gong is a powerful therapeutic space. 
Any place where gongs are set up and used becomes a sacred space because the gong is an ancient and revered instrument of healing and it has a presence that can be felt and sensed. Embracing the gong can open doors to new dimensions of well-being, spirituality, and connection with oneself. Thanks for watching.